8.30 on Sky News. But joining me, my next guest on the program is Liberal Senator James Patterson from our Melbourne studio. Thanks very much for your time today. Another push for press freedom. This is obviously going to be something that's going to be a big talking point when Parliament resumes uh, next week. The key push being made today is for warrants to be contestable. So when the AFP wants to be able to issue a warrant and get access to journalists' phones or whatever it might be, that can be debated. Do you have sympathy for that position? Well, Tom, as we've discussed before, I have sympathy for the concerns that many Australians have about press freedom, but equally the importance of balancing that against our national security needs. Um, as the Prime Minister has said, as the Communications Minister has said, we will be listening very carefully to constructive suggestions put forward by media companies uh, on ways in which we can uh, better protect uh, the work that they do, the important work that they do, and we'll be very soberly uh, considering those recommendations. And if there are areas where the law can be improved, we'll absolutely take action on that. This is a pretty specific uh, option being put forward today, though, with the reason being at the moment there's basically no real check on this and the raids carried out uh, in the, on the home of a journalist here in Canberra uh, a few weeks ago were done just on the sign-off of one court registrar. Is that really enough of a, a contest there, issuing that warrant? Well, Tom, you and I have discussed this issue uh, before and, and I'm someone who thinks that we should look very carefully uh, and, and seriously at, at proposals like this uh, because we do need to make sure that um, in a rule of law society um, that all players in this have an opportunity to make sure that their legal rights are upheld, uh, the legal rights of Australians to be protected and safe, but also the legal rights of journalists to uh, undertake their work uh, free from uh, any kind of fear of intimidation. So I think the government should look at these proposals very carefully and I'm sure we will. We'll wait to see what the Minister says after the case made today, 12.30. I'm sure you'll be tuning in, given your interest, Senator. Uh, okay. Speaking of tuning in, not sure if you caught the Bad Blood documentary, uh, making a few appearances yourself as well. I'm wondering what you made of Conchetta Faravanti-Wells saying that Scott Morrison's numbers, the people in his camp, were instructed in some way to vote for the spill when things came down to it to make sure it actually happened, otherwise he wouldn't have the top job. Tom, as you know, I participated uh, in this documentary because I thought, as a participant in those events, I had a duty to history to make sure that they were accurately recorded and that I could contribute to ensuring that was the case. But these are also historical events. Uh, they are something that the government uh, went through. Uh, it was very public, and this is another opportunity for the public to have an insight into it. Um, but they are historical, and we are moving on. And our um, focus now is just on delivering for the Australian people. We've been re-elected, and we've got an opportunity to do that over the next three years. It also goes, though, to the leader Scott Morrison purports to be, someone who supported Malcolm Turnbull all the way up till the end. This claim is that there were numbers that could have swung the contest. This leadership spill only got carried by a few of all of Scott Morrison supporters voted against the spill. We'd still have Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister. Surely it's, it's key to answer that question. Tom, my uh, contribution to the documentary was filmed before the election and I made it not knowing what the election outcome would be. Um, but even then, as I mm. am today, I'm not at all critical of Scott Morrison or his supporters or the way that they conducted themselves that week. Uh, any candidate was entitled to put themselves forward to the leadership. Any candidate was entitled uh, to encourage people to vote for them and support them if they believed that they uh, had something to offer, and clearly Scott Morrison did. Uh, and so I'm not critical at all of the way they conducted themselves. That must have been somewhat of a conversation in the wake of this amongst you and your colleagues, to what extent Scott Morrison, that his supporters might have helped make this happen, even if it was a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and supporting that spill might have helped that happen. Tom, from talking to my colleagues that week and since, I know that every single one of the people that voted in favour of the spill motion did so because they believed that change was necessary. And I think that uh, history has proven that they were right. Uh, we won the election. Uh, and we did so under Scott Morrison's leadership. So um, anyone who's trying to be critical of the people who proposed and sought that change, I think uh, history shows that they're on the wrong side of it. Peter Dutton says Malcolm Turnbull has trashed his legacy since. Do you agree? I'm not going to add anything more to what I already said on the program which was aired last night. Tom, my views are clear uh, on why the leadership change occurred and, and th that it was necessary. All right. Israel Folau in the news again. I know you have supported a Religious Discrimination Act. How would you envisage that works in application to this situation? 
Well, religious freedom is just one of the core cornerstones of our uh, free and open society. And we need to make sure that it is upheld and it's not being trampled upon. I'm very concerned with the way that the Israel Folau saga has played out, even though I don't share his religious views and I don't share his moral views. One of the things that's really concerned me this week and in the last few days, Tom, is the way in which his wife, uh, Maria Folau, has been targeted. I mean, are we seriously saying uh, in the 21st century that a wife must denounce her husband and distance herself from her husband in order to mm. continue to be employed, in order to avoid being uh, criticised by sponsors of her team. Uh, I thought that was really beyond the pale and, and a very troubling thing indeed. We're talking about the silver ferns there for the main part, so I, you know you might say that's out of our jurisdiction, but what if there is a, a religious discrimination act that you have an influence over, how should it apply to this particular situation? How would it change what we're seeing play out right now? I think the changes that we need are as much cultural and social as they are legal, Tom, because at the end of the day, you can't legislate for everything, you can't legislate for good sense. Um, what I would hope uh, comes out of this saga is that people would reassess what it means to be part of a pluralistic society, that we accept the fact that there are people who have different views. And I've got to pay tribute to Stephen Jones, the Labor MP, in his comments yesterday, saying this is part of living mm. in a multicultural, diverse society. Yes, there are people who have views that uh, we disagree with, and they're entitled to continue to hold down jobs, they're entitled to continue to be employed, they're entitled to continue right. to be Australian citizens with full rights and, and, and respect. And obviously, as a senator, you're very much a part of the moral debate, but you are a legislator. What should change? I'll go to a specific, if you like, what should change about what Rugby Australia has been able to do in regards to its contract in Israel Folau and his use of Twitter? Well, that's a legal case which is going to be a really important precedent uh, that will give some guidance to the government in how we legislate, depending on when it's resolved. We don't know how long that process will take to resolve, uh, but it will make clear uh, whether or not his contract in did, did indeed prevent him from saying the things he did, and if it did, whether R Rugby Australia was entitled to dismiss him on that basis or whether they have, in fact, um, in fact dismissed him unfairly. Um, so I'm watching that very closely, and I'll be very interested to see what the outcome is in the Fairway right. Commission and any subsequent appeals. But, but if your view is that he, sh he, he should be able to use Twitter in the way that he has, you're saying that if the, the outcome here is that the finding is that Rugby Australia was within its rights to act in that way, you would then like to change that law in some way? Well, there's two parallel issues here, Tom. There is what is wise and good and proper for Rugby Australia to do and what is legal or, un or unlawful. Um, I think Rugby Australia has acted... And that's what I want to get acted, to, the legal element. Yeah, but, I, but I, I think it's important to separate and explain the, the distinction between the two. I think Rugby Australia has... A, behaved appallingly in this and that they have not shown um, due consideration for Israel Folau's rights as an Australian citizen to uh, air his religious beliefs and I think they've conducted it uh, themselves appallingly. Um, whether or not uh, they should be entitled within law to do so is a different question and it will depend in part on this case and that's why I said Tom I'll be watching it very closely and I want to see what the outcome of that is. Uh, it may not be that we can legislate to make sure that no one should ever be dismissed in that instance. It may be too broad a brush to do that but it will be very interesting to see see what the Fair Work Commission decides and the courts if there are subsequent appeals. OK, something I'm sure we'll pick up again uh, on down the track. James Patterson, always appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.